Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. They want the stories of their young men told. They signed up for the duration of the war, having no idea how long their service would be. And there are important stories to be told, and we do tell a number of those stories. Today on Spotlight, a New York Times bestseller talks about what he accidentally discovered about his own dad during his book's research. Plus, a documentary about the Battle of St. Louis that many people have never heard of. And then hundreds of flags pay tribute to service members who were killed in the line of duty since 9-11. But first, a woman who joined the cadet nurse program during World War II, how she helped our nation's hospitals. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. Ruby Foster is a part of history. She's 94, she will be 95 in September. She served our country during World War II. When they came in, swooped in, and saved the country's health care system. They're all in their 90s now. Ruby Foster was a cadet nurse in the United States Cadet Nurse Corps. The cadet nurse program was a program at the very end of World War II, 1943 to 48, and it was to help with the country's lack of nurses. So many of the nurses were helping with the war efforts that the country's health care system nationally was close to collapsing. So President Roosevelt signed in the Bolton Act, which provided for them to recruit 125,000 single 17 to 35 year old young women and put them through accelerated nursing programs. The cadet nurses became heroes on the home front. They were, they were charge nurses in hospitals and they were doing things that many 17 and 18 year olds could not do today. So it's really um, uh, impressive. There was no way I was gonna get any uh, uh, advanced education outside of high school. My dad did not have that kind of money. And when I saw this poster, join the cadet nurse corps, I said, hey, that's for me. <laughs> yes, and I did, I was in the last class. Ruby joined when she was just 16 years old. Government paid us $10 a month the first year, 15 the second year, and I'm thinking 30, third year, three years. This was a three-year program. They are the only uniformed Corps members from World War II not recognized as veterans. When they signed up, they signed up for the duration of the war, having no idea how long their service would be to the country. It's kind of sad, and I just wish we could figure out a way to make that happen. Do you consider yourself a veteran? No, we're not, but we should be. And a couple of times it's made it through the House or the Senate, and it gets buried in another bill, and it just never has happened. But she was honored like a veteran thanks to the Greater St. Louis Honor Flight. It wasn't very long before I got a, a call from the gentleman and he said they had looked up the cadet nurse. They weren't familiar with it either and they'd done their research and that they would be happy to take Ruby and she would be their first cadet nurse to get to go. Oh, it was good. It was nice. I really enjoyed seeing those monuments and Oh, it's wonderful. She was also honored at a St. Louis Blues game. And they put her story on the Jumbotron, and then from she had a standing ovation. The entire St. Louis Blues Stadium was full. It was a sold-out crowd and a standing ovation. She stood up and do the, the little wave, and she had it down pat, and she was just thrilled. Thrilling is a word Ruby would also use to describe her friendship with Vicki. Best friend I ever had. I taught nursing for many years at Lewis and Clark Community College. Some of the nurses just said, you need to go meet this lady that just moved back here. And I went in and started talking to her and um, just found out that she was a cadet nurse. And we just had a lot of things in common and we just, we connected really well. She didn't have any family close by. And I started thinking about my grandkids and how I think they would really just really love her. The story of their friendship even inspired a book. We wrote a children's book called Miss Ruby, MS Ruby, and the Gigi Squad, G-I-G-I -G -I Squad, the kids being my squad, me being Gigi, 
And friendship comes in all ages, and the book is to hopefully encourage more children to want to friend older adults who maybe could use some kids in their life and bring them some sunshine. Ruby is considered a bonus grandma to Vicki's grandkids. Vicki also brings her nursing students in to meet Ruby. And there's one piece of advice she imparts on all of the future nurses she meets. Be good nurses or get out. <laughs> <laughs> Ruby Foster, a piece of history that helped our country by helping others. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Pulitzer Prize award-winning author Buzz Bissinger is known in St. Louis for his 2009 book, Three Nights in August, about the baseball Cardinals and then manager Tony La Russa, where the skipper's legendary style of management is explored. And Buzz is best known around the world for being the creator of the work, Friday Night Lights, first published in 1990. This storied look at the high school football culture in the town of Odessa, Texas, went on to, to explore the players, parents, coaches, city dwellers, and the game of football to a wide literary and television audience. When you see the title of his latest work, The Mosquito Bowl, and find out it deals with the real-life football game by Marines on Guadalcanal just before the bloody battle of Okinawa among former college football players in World War II, you can be forgiven for thinking that this is a book that revolves around the sport of football, but you'd be wrong. Bissinger uses the players and their backgrounds as a lens to tell the story of the lead up to and prosecution of part of the Pacific War until just before the direct assault on the home islands of Japan that took place by the Allies in 1944 and 1945. He does not shy away from the blood, the gore, the politics, sacrifice, and all that comes with war in general, and he doesn't shy away from the racism and sexism that the U.S. practiced to its detriment either. Uh, families of several of the players were incredibly helpful. They want the stories of their young men told, and they had kept everything. Not just letters that they wrote when they were on Okinawa, but letters written from camp, letters written from college. Remember, you know, that's how people communicated mm -hmm. back then. They kept report cards, they kept little drawings that they had done as kids, and so when I got my hands on that, I said, I, I, I think I can do it. I think there's a way uh, to do it and really portray these men so they come alive. And then there was this really odd, I don't know what you call it, coincidence involving my father. My father actually was a Marine. He actually was at Okinawa. I knew that much. He never talked about it, like many men could not talk about it because of what he had seen. He was 19 years old at the time of the battle. And I felt that that's my dad's private zone. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to probe him. I'm not going to ask him. But as I, as I was beginning to do the book, I said, well, I might as well look up his records. I'm looking up everyone else's records. Let's see. You know, let's see. Is he on the muster rolls? And I swear, they were easy to get. I'm looking down. I'm looking down. And I say, that's my name because we have the same name, Harry G. Bissinger. So he was there, but was spooky. He was on the front lines. He was a rifleman in one of the regiments that I'm writing about. Because wow. I'm writing about two regiments, the 4th and the 29th, and he was in the 4th. It was hard to write. It's a complex book. It's about a certain type of America that existed in the 1920s and 1930s. There's a part about racism. Um, there's a part about uh, the brutality of our attitudes about immigration. But... It's also about young men, I still think of them as boys, serving with duty without question, serving with honor, willing to sacrifice for our principles of, of freedom. And it, so there's tragedy, because I'm portraying many of the 15 who died, but there's uplift, because I think at the end you appreciate and you understand the horror of what they went through. There's a lot of combat in it, you understand the horror of what they went through, but you appreciate it, and you see that in their own way they really were heroes, although they would never... I interviewed veterans from the regiments who were still alive, and if you called them a hero, they would get mad. They would say, I'm not a hero. Do not say that about me. I am not a hero. I did what I had to do. To hear how the Navy saved college football during World War II and why the sport trained good officers, watch the full interview at hecmedia.org. They are the best-selling authors and all of your favorite genres. For in-depth, one-on-one interviews, go to hecmedia.org. 
from Bush Stadium in downtown St. Louis. Welcome to Cardinals baseball as the Cardinals play the second game of a four-game series against the Los Angeles Dodgers. The Dodgers. St. Louis is a baseball town. Smith, court 20 to right down the line. With a long history of epic victories. But on May 26th, 1780, the site of this ball field was the center of a battlefield. And what took place in St. Louis that afternoon reshaped the future of the city and possibly the entire American West. And it all happened in less time than it takes to play a baseball game. Well, I think most people, when you first say the Battle of St. Louis, think it must have been an American Civil War battle. They come up to me afterwards and say, I never heard of this before. Probably one of the most significant and underrated battles of the entire American Revolution. It was the first of only two Revolutionary War battles fought west of the Mississippi, with a legacy that has rippled across two and a half centuries of American history. The Battle of St. Louis is one of the reasons why Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan are now part of the United States rather than Canada. People just don't know about it. And then when they hear about it, they refuse to believe it. Certainly never learned about it in school and went to school here in St. Louis, grade school and high school and college. Never remember hearing about it at any of that. The vast majority of the books written about the American Revolution are written by authors in Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Maryland, Virginia. Gee, I see a pattern there. It's East Coast snobbery. In St. Louis, a few reminders of the battle still exist, but not many. The only genuine relic that survives is the church bell used to warn the town it was coming under attack. For a long time, the story of the battle itself was under attack. In the late 19th century, there were historians who denied that it had ever happened. And then the evidence turned up that it, in fact it had happened, and it turned out to be a much bigger story than anybody had anticipated. Now, a pair of history detectives is trying to fill in the rest of the blanks, looking for clues buried in ancient documents written in three languages, hidden on two continents. It's a completely different set of stories that are just fascinating and that we're still learning about. The attack on St. Louis was led by the British, but they recruited Native Americans to do most of the fighting. They knew they had to pick a side. Some of it was trying to make calculated decisions in a way that wouldn't get too many of them killed. The Battle of St. Louis is a story of keen foresight, vainglorious mistakes, redemption, high hopes, and false hopes. You have this group that's in bondage. They're listening to this. Liberty, freedom, it sounds really great. I want that too. The St. Louisans who came under attack that day were outnumbered three to one but a surprise, thunderous defense led to their unlikely victory. Oh, say can you see? If St. Louis's ragtag militia had lost the fight at this spot on that day, today, these St. Louisans might be standing for the singing of God Save the Queen at a cricket match instead of a baseball game. Between St. Louis and Los Angeles, the visiting team from Mexico. If the British had won the battle at St. Louis, the world would be a different place. Had St. Louis fallen, maybe we'd still be having tea at four o'clock with our pinky in the air. ATC Media's House of Thunder documentary is now available on History Fix. Visit HistoryFix.com and use promo code HEC9MO for a seven-day free trial and 10% off a year-long subscription. Then head out to the new American Revolutionary War Museum exhibit on display at the St. Charles County Heritage Museum. 
My name is Stephen L. Kling, Jr. My small publishing company, THGC Publishing, entered into a partnership with St. Charles County to do a museum exhibit on the American Revolutionary War in the West. The idea here was that uh, a few years ago I wrote a book on the Battle of St. Louis and talked to a lot of people that wanted to know more that the Battle of St. Louis didn't happen in a vacuum and that there were actually events that went on up and down the entire Mississippi River throughout the war. So I gathered a group of authors from the U.S. and Spain and we wrote a book on the, called The American Revolutionary War in the West and this exhibit is based on that book. There was a great effort to combine period artifacts, uh, weapons and regalia and other things. Beautiful paintings uh, specially made for the exhibit and the book. We have a number of copies of documents. We received permission from the Archivo in Seville, Spain that people have never published before. And beautiful costumed and uniformed mannequins. I worked real closely with Stephen Kling with a lot of research. We went by uh, photographs, we went by actual paintings and uh, early drawings of the period. From there, I started creating these uniforms. Um, my day generally began as early as 2.30 in the morning, and I would work all the way until about 6.30 at night, and this is what I did for almost three years. Well, it was a great effort to not only talk about the battles, which of course are part of the history, but we really wanted to focus on the people that were involved in it. In the 18th century, St. Louis and St. Charles were really closely connected. People such as Louis Blanchet, a French-Canadian man who founded St. Charles, he was at the Battle of St. Louis. The Midwest and the Mississippi River Valley has broad connections to even the early eras of American history. So often, Missouri basically gets covered from about 1820 to 1821 for the Missouri Compromise. Um, other than that, though, it usually kind of gets passed over. And so when people come through here, we really want them to understand how their community came to be and how this community developed. We want them to also understand the role we had in some of the less comfortable topics of history. So we want people to understand our place in this broad narrative of American history. What we hope people will learn from the exhibit is, uh, one, what happened out here and led to the Louisiana Purchase and other things that helped make our country, but more importantly, to learn about the experiences people went through and that the history was broader. There was a very diverse group of people in many respects more diverse than what was going on in the 13 colonies. And there are important stories to be told, and we do tell a number of those stories. The great part about the museum exhibit, it's free and it's open to the public. On display at the St. Louis County Heritage Museum. Exhibit info can be found on Facebook at Steve Kling BOS. For more videos highlighting our region's history for your homeschool and classroom learner, check out our educational website, educate.today. Use the keyword St. Louis History. A gorgeous rendition of America the Beautiful, later on Spotlight. 2021 marked the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Flags of Valor St. Louis commemorated the event by placing over 7,000 flags on Art Hill to pay tribute to the United States service members killed in the line of duty since 9-11. When you walk here and once they put the dog tags up, what you hear is tinkle, 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 tinkle. It's haunting. Putting up 7,582 flags for uh, all the military that were killed after 9-11. You say 7,000 and you can't comprehend that number until you walk through the flags and realize every one of those is a man or a woman who died, left the family. It's just incomprehensible uh, how many people, uh, nobody can grasp that until they walk through these flags and realize that those were all people that had a future and decided to volunteer for the military service and protect this country. We have 500 volunteers that 
uh, were part of putting the flags together. We did that on weekends uh, all through, uh, through the middle of June, all through the end of July. And so those same volunteers now are back here to put the flags up and they will also be back here to take the flags down. And the, nu the numbers and the dog tags are the most important part. The flags, straight up and down. It's about perfection, not about speed. Think of it this way, that if you're the family member of someone that's fallen, you come to the hill, your flag doesn't look like the rest, you'll feel a little bit slighted. So let's make sure that we have them all perfect. Make sure that the flags are set up at the top, that they're straight and tight. Everything else is perfect. If it's not perfect, take it down and do it again. But working with the uh, Special Forces in 2002 and been work all through those 16 difficult and hard years until September 2018. Uh, I'm helping people put the flags for those who lost their lives in Afghanistan. This is for me like I'm picking up my dad's family brother who lost their life. Then when I take this flag here, that means I'm I'm hugging my own brothers. So she was the chief foreign disclosure officer telling, sharing information with the Afghan uh, military intelligence. And she was killed on May 20th, 2009, on her way to an intelligence sharing uh, mission between, on the road between Kabul and Bagram. She passed in 2006 in Iraq, uh, two years before I was born, so I never got to personally meet her, but um, I've been able to hear stories and my everyone in my family says I look like her, so I often get called Amanda. Um, I share the same middle name with her. I think it's an honor to be able to look at all these flags because you look at these flags and you're able to like know that the people here today, they have lost a loved one and they're able to stand here and they're able to honor their memory placing these flags out for all of these brave individuals who risk their lives trying to save our country and keep it the place that it is today that we have our freedom. My son was Specialist Jackson Johnson. He was killed in Kuwait March 5th, 2019. He wanted to serve his country. He wanted to do something to make the world better. It's a mix of emotions of heartwarming, of heartbreak, of honor, respect. It's just a mix of emotions just as a ghost star mom looking at every flag that is honoring every fallen soldier from 2001 till now. Yeah, this means a lot to me. This reminds my fallen brothers, which we lost in the war in Afghanistan. And that's, that means they will never forget them, and they will, no one will forget them. And they're always in our heart. Their place is here. But there are so many more people that have risked their lives to keep this country the way it is. And the people should be grateful, and they should honor those people's memories. I want them to think of their freedom and what that means to them. 
and not just remember every fallen soldier, but remember all the military that's still out there fighting for their freedom and giving their all to protect each and every one of us around the world. Um, it's not just about the fallen soldiers, it's about the ones enlisted and left behind to battle as well. But we just ask that people say their names, remember them. Don't let their memory or their existence die away. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. Next week, an exhibit presenting student work from CAMS Art Reach program. Plus, the Missouri Chamber Music Festival is coming up and we have all the details. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.